States, instead of moving them directly to Oklahoma, it took a long route that wound up going into Illinois, and folk, I don't know really why, but they did not go straight into Oklahoma. And from, to this day, you can see roads, it's called the Trail of Tears, uh, the Indians wept along the way. Now, some Indians managed to escape by hiding out in the thick woods of the Appalachian. Their descendants are still there. And the Seminole Indians will brag that they never surrendered. The Seminole Indians went all the way down here to the Everglades, where the white man did not want to go. Too many rattlesnakes, too many copperheads, and too many bobcats, and other forms of wildlife, and mosquitoes, and whatever, and diseases. But anyway, these Indian Seminole Indians went down here, and they will brag that they never surrendered to the white man. Um, anyway, those Indians got to remain. But the other Indians living in the south were kicked out of the uh, country and moved all the way over to Oklahoma, where the Jackson said, here, you can live your own life, and I promise we white people will never get to Oklahoma. We all know the end of that story. Uh, but a lot of Cherokees still live in Oklahoma. I mean, once the white man got to Oklahoma, by the time he got to Oklahoma, he was already moving past and already gone to California and Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. So, uh, but anyway, the whites eventually moved into Oklahoma and took over and uh, uh, left the Indians with little choice but to try to assimilate. Right, we'll get back to the Indians later. The state of Georgia could ignore a decision that disagreed with. Jackson said so himself. But then came another issue. Well, what if, this, if a state disagreed with a law passed by Congress and signed by the president? Jackson looked on that differently. In the matter of the tariff, all right. The southern people did not want a high tariff. They found out that when the tariff went up, trade went down. They had a difficult time selling the products abroad. But Jackson, and they believed that since Jackson was a southerner, he'd agree with them. But Jackson wanted to build up a strong army. There was no other tax that the federal government had other than a high tariff. So a tariff bill was passed called the Tariff of Abomination. The word abomination means utterly detestable utterly detestable sin. Anyway, a series of tariffs were passed. These tariffs were looked on with disfavor in the South. The South's cotton exports were already hurting and the tariff only lowered the price of cotton even more. And folk, I want to say this. If it had not been for the agitation stirred up by Northern anti-slave people, Slavery might have ended peacefully in this country because as the price of cotton went down and it continued to go down, as the price of cotton went down, the value of slave labor was going to get less and less and eventually economics might have forced slaves out. Then later, years after the Civil War, the boll weevil came up from Mexico. The boll weevil was a plant that just loved to eat cotton and nothing else. And the boll weevil destroyed a lot of the South's cotton crops and it taught the Southerners they must grow something else besides cotton, slavery would possibly have ended by 1880 to 1900 if only people would have just left the issue alone and it might have ended peacefully. But that's one of these what might have been. But the price of cotton was to continue to go down until the bull weevil hit and then cotton, there was hardly any cotton to sell. Now today, we can handle the bull weevil, but when it first hit, they couldn't. Now, a group of southern politicians from South Carolina, headed by Vice President Calhoun, drew up a document saying, if Congress oversteps its boundaries, a state could nullify that law that Congress passed. Jackson said no. He had signed the law. All right. Before I get to page 7, though, here, I'd better pause. I'll take care of some other business. Uh, Uh, okay, roll call. Is Sicily here? Anitha, 
Yeah. Okay. Vincent. Vincent Perez. Wilbertine. Okay. Raul. Lucy. Um, Quamicia Massey. Sarah Zane Garrett, okay. Regina uh, Juan. Riley, Akib, oh, you're Riley, okay, Akib. Last name B O K A Y N A, Bokanya. Okay. Mary, Jose, and oh, one is here. Yeah, but one is here. Kang Trugal. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm missing Sitali, Vincent, Raul, Carmicia, Sarah, Akib, Exalci. All right, the rest will be kind of present. Okay. Um, now, South Carolina. In effect, I mean, I, I, I had an eighth grade history. She said, South Carolina had the attitude of, if you don't play ball my way, I'm going to take my ball and bat and go home. I used to coach softball, and I had a player like that, and finally a player took the ball and bat, and we went our separate ways and have stayed our separate ways. But anyway, leaving that, um, they, after all, Calhoun said, Kentucky had attempted to nullify the Alien Sedition Acts. He also could have said that Georgia had nullified the Supreme Court decision. So Jackson began to shut out Vice President Calhoun. Now there was another reason. Keep in mind, all right, Jackson's wife, wife Rachel had been slandered. Well, Jackson's Secretary of War, John Eaton, married a dance girl, and it was a girl of questionable reputation. Mrs. Calhoun refused, oh, we're too high society for a woman like that. And she would not recognize Peggy Eaton at all. Peggy O'Neill had been her maiden name when she married her name became Peggy Eaton. So uh, Peggy Eaton was ostracized. Jackson, remembering how his own departed wife had been slandered, he took sides with his Secretary of War Eaton against Calhoun, Mrs. Calhoun. Right? With, with Jackson's wife deceased, Mrs. Calhoun was leading the Washington Female Society. Van Buren, the Secretary of State, took sides with Jackson on that issue also. Anyway, the two of them got into a party one day, Vice President Calhoun and President Jackson, and they wanted to see, well, what does Jackson really think about nullification? So Jackson gave a toast, and he toasted, Our Federal Union, it must and shall be preserved. Calhoun toasted, I said, that, remember, the Federal Union can only be preserved if it recognizes and respects the rights of the state. South Carolina went on to declare the 1828 tariffs null and void in that state. Foreign vessels began to head to South Carolina where they heard the tariffs would not be collected. Jackson acted decisively. He said, I'm going, I'll send an army to South Carolina and I'll hang every rebellious South Carolina and I'll start, and I'll hang Calhoun first. Calhoun resigned the vice presidency. One of only two vice presidents do so. The other was Spiro Agnew in 1974. But anyway, no, that was 73, and Agnew resigned in 1973. But anyway, Calhoun resigned the vice presidency so that he said, I can do more good from the Senate than I can as vice president. Well, uh, 
And make long story short, up stepped Henry Clay. Henry Clay, the great compromiser. Henry Clay said, well, I see the both sides, so he said, well, that's what let's do. Let's gradually reduce the tariffs a little bit at a time. It did. It happened. And even Jackson agreed. Both sides agreed to it. They reduced the tariffs. South Carolina felt like they had won. South Carolina felt like they'd established that they would have the right to leave the Union. But anti-slavery sentiment in the North could lead to slavery being outlawed. And of course, South Carolina said, if that happens, we're going to be ruined. Thus, if, a, if the North becomes too anti-slavery, we will leave the Union. All right. Um, under Nicholas Biddle, the Bank of the United States had been well managed, but Jackson said the bank benefits the rich and keeps the poor poor and keeps the rich rich. The bank is too powerful, I'm going to destroy it. Jackson at this point was a very sick man and operating the government from his bedside. Uh, could hardly get up and walk. Again, he was suffering from lead poisoning, one other things. The bank's charter was going to expire in 1836, but Henry Clay believed he could win the 1832 election if he had the bank charter renewed just before the election. But it did not work. Riddle applied for charter renewal. Jackson vetoed the charter. In language, it says that the charter operates for the benefit of the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Um, again, Jackson was becoming the Democrat that the Democratic Party was to become later, supposedly the party of the poor. All right. Henry Clay used the uh, bank as an issue, but Henry Clay lost. Jackson became president in 1832, and uh, Jackson's party controlled Congress, so Henry Clay could not override Jackson's veto. Jackson decided he was going to destroy the bank before its charter actually expired, which it would have expired in 1836 anyway. He said, I'm going to destroy it. So he took federal money, the deposits from the bank, and placed these deposits in other banks called pet banks. Well, here is the problem. These pet banks loaned money too freely to the poor and free, too free to people who were de developing the West. Biddle had to call in loans because of a low money supply in the Bank of the United States. When he did, a minor recession resulted. People blamed the recession on the Bank of the United States. Jackson blamed it on the bank also. Um, this was to lead to a major depression later. The economy took off. Mexico had some uh, silver mines. There were a lot of silver mines in Mexico and New Mexico, and these this silver found its way to American banks. And then the banks using this silver began to issue paper money huh, with banknotes. All right. Jackson paid off the national debt the only time in history the American government had a surplus of money. So, um, with, the, with the money seemingly running out of hand, inflation taking over, and folks, this is what happens when you have too much money in the system. The money becomes worth less and less. So the Treasury Department issued a new type of money well, no, not a new type of part. They issued a species circular. The species circular said public land can only be purchased with federally coined gold and silver coins. Well, bankers started tightening up their loans. And in April 1837, a whole bunch of business failures came about. In other words, the end of the economic boom came suddenly. Now, the Panic of 1837 was actually caused by Andrew Jackson. Any history book today you read will tell you that. But Jackson left office in March 1837. Van Buren, his Secretary of State, took office. When Van Buren was elected in November of 1836. So if Van Buren took office in March 1837, Van Buren said, we're going to follow in the footsteps of our illustrious predecessor in April. The bottom dropped out, you might say. 
bank failures, business failures came about, Martin Van Buren got the blame, and to some extent he deserved it because Martin Van Buren knew that the problem was Jackson's war on the bank, but Van Buren did not want to go against Jackson, so he didn't want to offend Jackson, who was still alive. So Van Buren did not do anything to uh, really help the situation. He had saved, as Vice President, he had saved Jackson from the President's enemies and the President's temper. Anyway, um, Van Buren almost lost the election of 1836 because, but again, you had too many candidates on the Whig side, so that helped. Helped Van Buren. Well, it took Van Buren four years to get an independent treasury system approved by Congress. By that time, it was too late. Come up to the election now of 1840. I want to say this. This is not in the notes. I'm going to tell you, but Van Buren was the first president to sign a law that limited federal employees to 40-hour work week. Five days a week, eight hours a day, five days a week. Uh, again, this, this was, uh, he was the first one to do that. Had it not been for Jackson, Van Buren might actually go down as being a fairly good president, but he was blamed for the problems that actually were caused by Jackson. All right, 1840. The Whigs were more united than had been in 1836. They chose General William Henry Harrison. Parties were put up to sway votes. Slogans were typical slogan at the time was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Tippecanoe was Harrison's big victory over the Indians. Tyler was Harrison's vice president. Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Van Van is a used up man. They pictured Martin Van Buren sitting in a White House drinking costly wines and indifferent to the suffering his misrule had caused, but Harrison was pictured as being a poor man like themselves, when actually Harrison was just as wealthy as Van Buren, if not more so. Harrison lived in a big mansion. But nevertheless, they pictured Harrison as being a poor man, though he wasn't. Um, Harrison won by a landslide. Again, the problem was the Panic of 1837, had destroyed Van Buren. Now, William Henry Harrison, as he was running, there were whispers going around. You know, they didn't have telephones as such. I mean, that, but there were that William Henry Harrison is in bad health. To dispel these rumors, William Henry Harrison would crash in on a party, go into a party, laughing up and waving a big storm, acting like everything was okay. Nobody knew, except for his closest servants, that he had actually gotten up from a bed, hurriedly dressed himself, gotten out and crashed the party, laughed a big time and waved and shouted and, uh, you know, campaigned vigorously, then hurriedly left the party, got in his coach and went back to bed. Nobody knew that but a few people. But he actually was a very, very sick man. 